Hi, friends. You are listening to the EntreEd Talk podcast, where we feature amazing educators and entrepreneurs showcasing how you can bring entrepreneurship into the classroom. We believe entrepreneurship is for everyone. I am your host, Toy Hirschman, and I am so glad you chose to join me on this journey. Let's go. All right, welcome back to another episode of the Entre Ed Talk podcast. I am so excited. This is actually part two that I get to talk with Stephanie Kraus. She is the author of Making It, What Today's Kids Need for Tomorrow's World. I'm gonna have her do a brief, give us a brief bio again, just for any of y'all that missed it. But if you if you did miss the first part, please go back and listen. It's really wonderful. And Stephanie is just so much fun. And this book is so amazing. You really have to check it out, especially if you're an educator or someone that is supporting young people. So Stephanie, why don't you give us a little bit of background about yourself, and then we will dive back into your awesome book and all of these great topics. Thanks, Toy. Um, the good thing is about this being a part two that I don't think my bio is ever the same. So we'll see what comes out here on this episode. Um, but as of next week, I actually am at the time of recording this in the middle of a really big transition. I have just launched a new consulting shop called First Quarter Strategies, and um, that kicks off in the beginning of May, so just a couple days from now. Um, and the focus of that shop is really on working with leaders across systems and sectors and communities in the US on what young people need to be ready for life, which is what the book Making It is about, but also with folks in the workforce and higher ed on how they need to get their spaces ready for the young people who are coming to them to, for tomorrow's workers and students. Um, so in terms of how I got both to launching first quarter and writing, making it, my background is in education and in social work. So I started out in the classroom um, in a pre-K class, which was so hard. I think that was the hardest thing I ever did. And then moved into fifth grade, was a middle school coach, and eventually was running a school and a nonprofit um, on a technical college campus focused on young people who had been pushed or pulled out of school, but really wanted to come back and finish. An important part of my bio is that I closed that school on purpose. Um, it was long, it was hard, it was messy, it was painful, but ultimately we found that running a public high school at that time in that policy environment for older youth and young adults, we couldn't actually do everything that we knew they needed in order to be ready for life after graduation. And that was a moral conflict. We knew we would never get to mission, which was engaging and equipping these young people for a changing world, if we had to do all of the requirements of a Missouri Public High School diploma. And so that um, departure was a shift for me eight years ago from local practice to national work. Um, you and I are also both moms of boys, and I, my boys are 10 and 8. Um, and my household has been a homeschool all pandemic year. Yeah, I think I, I mentioned on the last podcast, I was not excited to be the unpaid principal of Hirschman Homeschool Academy. <laughs> I was so grateful that I had my amazing mother that that decided to carve out her pandemic time and come and we kind of split the difference. <laughs> we were like, you take a boy, I'll take a boy. Um, we're just make this work. Um, and she took the easier one actually, which wasn't really, <laughs> she, she took the one that was really, anyway, um, we'll get into it. But, but I think our audience, my audience knows my amazing son, Carl and how brilliant he is. And also how, um, frustrating he can be because he's a little me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can understand that for sure. <laughs> So, oh, so I'm so thrilled to have you back again, Stephanie. Um, so Stephanie's book is, I'm going to kind of give this 30, 30,000 mile high overview um, because I really want to talk about the competencies. Um, I want to talk about the four C's, uh, which are which are credentials, competencies, connections, and cash. 
um, which sort of frame frame the whole book. And um, they're really, really wonderful. Again, if you have an opportunity, you need to go grab this book. And there's an audio version for those of you that that like the audio version too. So that's, um, I, you know, just, I kind of, I have both. So <laughs> I like, I like oh, that's awesome. and toy we've, we've got to talk about that for a second. When you write a book, you don't get to, well, at least if you're in the author bracket, I am, I was not able to choose who was my audio person. Oh, wow. And I had heard horror stories of women who had men chosen and I had stories. I, there are stories in the book of like my boys and, you know, me as a mom, I tried to be personal and professional on it. And so I was delighted. I was so nervous. I got a copy of the audio book um, right when it was available. I didn't even get to like preview it beyond a couple of lines. And the good news is it was another Midwest mom with like curly hair and a nose ring, which if you were to see me, that is, that is me who also has kids the same age. And I was so grateful, but it was a very scary experience. So I have been walking through the audiobook myself. Um, and I will say she did amazing. It's really, yeah. if you are an audiobook, person, it's good. That is, that is really interesting because, um, I assume that you would like that you picked and interviewed this like person. That's, that's incredible. Cause she does, she does an amazing job. Like, I feel like I've, I feel like I got your personality came kind of through that that but it's re it's really yeah beautiful. I mean I think I think she like harnessed every house school homeschooling pandemic life parent because that was when she was recording it and we're now in touch um but yeah she did a she did a masterful job that's incredible I didn't, I didn't realize that. That's really cool. It's cool to know. <laughs> I wonder if I ever publish my book, if I will get to choose. That's kind of, kind of interesting. <laughs> so, okay. So, so your, so your book making it talks about these, these four C's, these critical currencies that'll serve, that'll serve young people throughout their lives. And those are credentials, competencies, connections, and cash. And the book talks about the world of the world and the workforce and how that's changing and what that means for education and preparing young people, which is what we're about, what this podcast, what our organization is about as well. Um, and understanding how these changes are impacting young people and reshaping, you know, this is some, we're kind of, we're coming into an era where this is totally different from, you know, the, the norms, I guess, that, that we grew up with even. And, um, you have some great practical information about every age and stage, which makes sense now because you you went from pre-K. <laughs> you, you really did. You really had the whole span. Um, and the book, the book is wonderful, and it challenges your your kind of your belief system of what you know what we grew up with versus what our what our children are growing up in the with in the world that they're coming into. So. I'm just excited to dive into these. So I really wanted to frame this this talk and talk about those four C's. And um, I think the first thing would be would be interesting to dive into are um, this this idea of credentials and the idea of them being different than what we kind of knew. Um, I don't consider myself an old person, but old enough <laughs> to to have grown up with this. I mean, there was no option for me. It was you're going to go to you're going to go to school, you're going to get good grades, and you're going to college. And once you finish college, you're done. And my 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 dad even gave me a hug when I graduated from from my undergrad and said, "Okay, you're off the hook. Like you you've completed your mission. Now you can go do whatever you're." whatever your next mission is, but it was not an option for, for me or for my brothers. Um, and that's not so true anymore necessarily. And I don't know that it's true now, you know, I, if my kids want to go to college, that's great. But I kind of have this idea that if they don't, as long as they're moving in their direct, in a direction that benefits them and the world, I'm happy with it. So can you talk a little bit about that and how that's different than what we kind of grew up with. So I'm so glad you teed that up because not only do I think it's different from how we grew up and what we understood, but I actually think that 
it's increasingly and quickly getting more and more distant from most public school districts understanding of what college and career readiness is. And even for those districts that have now started, thanks to some really good news articles and narrative change to say technical school is an option or apprenticeships are an option, that's still only looking at two or three pathways. And actually the reality of the post-secondary marketplace, the opportunity marketplace that young people enter after high school is way more complicated than that, way more nuanced and textured. And um, I was shocked when I, when I left local work eight years ago, the first few years I was working for national nonprofits still in the K-12 and youth development space. And then I had this opportunity to run the national campaign that was all about credentials. It was called Connecting Credentials. And it had been funded by Lumina Foundation, which is the largest higher education found funder foundation in the country, um, to try to make sense and bring together the traditional credentialing folks, the colleges and universities, their associations, their membership groups, with now an incredible incredibly large group of new and not traditional credentialing providers. And I remember being in the thick of this. It was a little more than a one-year campaign, really focused on equity because there aren't really quality controls around things that some educators will have heard of actually for their own professional development, things like micro-credentials, nano degrees, certificates. Um, but I, I talk about this in the book, and there's a table actually that shows that we have hundreds of thousands more credentials, post-secondary credentials coming up on the market every single year. And the crazy part of this is at this point, half of them are not being given out by colleges and universities. So the way that the sort of credentialing landscape looks is that you have these university degrees, which often are so expensive. I think it was something like in 30 years, prices went up by 900%. You know, the amount of debt that folks are taking on. But even with those degrees, some employers now are, are opting for skill-based hiring. They're not requiring degrees. They want you to prove you have the competencies and skills or you know the right people and you have the networks that will make you good at the job. Now, that's not true for every employer, but it is true for a growing number of them. So what we know from the research is getting a credential still matters. Most employers want to see it. It gets you into more sort of competitive spaces for jobs. And often it helps you negotiate for more money. Um, so generally speaking, a credential is still important, but then the diversity of the credential really breaks down from there. Um, and so what I actually offered in the chapter was not a prescriptive plan, but a set of questions that I actually think what our kids need, what our students need is to sit down and to do a very holistic, practical plan. Because the other piece of this, and we talked about this a little bit on part one, is that potentially with the right resources and opportunities, our boys and kids their age could live to be a hundred, which means the possibility of an 80 year work life. If you think about working that long during a time when we're, things are changing so much, jobs are changing, the world is changing. It's no longer what your dad did or what we experienced, which is what do you want to be when you grow up? Go to college for that and then follow that career path singular and just change over if some crisis happens or some big thing happens, but that's kind of the exception. Instead, these kids are looking at the potential of an 80-year work life, which means eight to 10 careers, potentially, 15 to 20 jobs, and having to go back 
And so the last thing I'll say here is I think that not only do we need that comprehensive plan that's really based in inquiry, what can you afford? What do you want? What kind of environment do you want? But also this like application of a now next principle. And we need to actually shrink. My friend at Lumina Foundation, Amber, and I talked about shrinking the time horizon and looking at what can life look like in the next five years? And what is the credential that will serve you? Not because it's what you're supposed to do, but what is the what is the credential as a currency that will serve you in, in getting the opportunities you need or want, hopefully need and want um, in the next couple of years, but not forever. That's so that's so good because it's you know I, I'm I'm kind of in I feel like I'm in the in the transition of that like from the traditional sort of model of you know, you, you get this job and you get a career and then, you know, you come out the other end 30 or 40 years later with a toaster or a watch <laughs> and, and, you retire <laughs> and, um, and that's not, that hasn't been my journey at all. Um, and I know that it's going to be even more, I don't want to say tumultuous, but kind of, it's, it's going to be even more that way for my, for my children. And it's, that's really, that's really a neat idea of looking at that, like, what am I doing right now? What do I, where do I see this going in the short term and what's going to, what is going to yeah. benefit me? And as an adult, you kind of see that sometimes through your career, sometimes looking backwards too, you're like, oh, you know, that didn't make sense at the time, but now I see how that plugs into what I'm doing. You know, that thing that I learned is plugging into what I'm doing now. Um, yeah. And I'll add one other thing, Toy, that like later today, I'll be talking to a group of college students. And one of the things that I think is important is how does that that job life, that working life, that post-secondary life not feel frantic? Um, and so the what I would encourage educators who are listening in or parents to be thinking about is that I think that the through lines for kids can be what are the the interests, issues, and ideas that you are really passionate about or you care about. Because jobs and careers can change, but if there are a set of interests and issues and ideas that really move a young person, that can be the stability that previous generations got by being a company man, right? And like, get it, where is your identity as the worker coming from? Will have to be anchored, I think, in those things rather than the place where you're working or the type of job that you have. I love that. That's so good because that's, I mean, that's what drives, you know, that's also what drives change and what will make these these kids resilient when they get into that whatever that workforce looks like, which is kind of crazy. Um, you, you mentioned about, about us, I guess, as, as like older people and parents, like taught and, and educators talking, you talk about networks. Um, you talk about connections in your book. And I love, I love the idea of you kind of split these up into this lifelines, door openers, and navigators. And I'd love for you to share that and how some of the strategies of how you you be that, you be a, a lifeline, a door opener, and a navigator. Because as we know, it's those networks and those connections that that get you that like you get to a certain point in a career and these kids will probably get there quicker than we did, where it's you're not really sending out a resume every time you you built this network of people and that's where your next opportunity comes from. So how can you explain those three things and how we can be them? Yeah, so working in tandem with credentials and competencies and cash is what I actually think could be the most powerful currency, both in terms of how kids do emotionally, mentally, relationally in life, just like well-being and the actual making it of opportunity. Um, so connections are the relationships that we have. And I think what's important maybe for us to consider is the way that I think about those three types is actually in the life of my own boys or kids that I might teach or work with. I want to know what is their sort of, what's their social health? And then what's their social wealth? Because there's the relationships that feed and nurture us 
And then there are the relationships that benefit us. And sometimes those two are the same. And sometimes they're not the same. And what's important on the social wealth side, sometimes called social capital, is that young people from wealthier communities, um, often whiter, wealthier communities, this tracks with financial wealth. They're born with a social bank account between family and friends and family, you know, friends of friends. They can reach out to people who are known by people they know for opportunity, for exposure, for experience. And for kids who may be in very loving and supportive homes, but uh, extremely working class, or, you know, really struggling to get by and generational poverty. And this can be anywhere. This can be in the city, rural communities, tribal communities, right, all over. Um, they're not going to have that social capital to connect them to opportunities, which often are people taking a risk on them. And so as educators, we have to design for that. And, you know, in pandemic life, I don't know, actually, that we realize how much of that was lost for kids who might be in a house where their parents are struggling to get by or whoever is raising them, grandma, you know, wherever they are, foster care home, they lack those social connections. And those come from athletics and the arts and the entrepreneurship camp and, you know, all of those out of school time spaces actually are hugely beneficial, not only for scholarships, but for these social sponsorships into internships or starting something, you know, service learning. Um, so we really need to pay attention to that. But in terms of these like practical strategies, so in the book, I talk about these three types of relationships, and then you do have sort of okay, how do you even know, like, what are the characteristics of each? And then how do you build them for young people? So lifelines, this is like that old adage that we, I, most of us in education and youth development know, which is um, that the life of a child can be radically changed by that one caring adult. And I would say, yes, and <laughs> A network of caring adults is better than one, <laughs> you know, like one can make a difference, but really there's a community of people that need to come around a young person. So lifelines don't need to bring social capital. They just need to bring love and support. This is friends, families. These are your lifers. These are my girlfriends who have known me forever, who keep me honest, who let me be fully myself. And like, we just have each other. We all need lifelines. What I'll say about that, and I name it in the book, is that because this is a time of such volatility, we see kids today really um, craving stability and security. And so one thing I suggest in the book that I'll say here is I think that lifelines is where it's going to be found. That in a time when we can't promise them economic stability or even educational stability, can we promise them some level of social stability and security in their relationships with friends and family. Um, so that's lifelines. And you build them yourself by just showing up for your kids, whoever your kids are, whether those are your biological kids, the kids in your classroom, the kids on your soccer field, right? You show up for your kids. You're there for them. You support them. You love them. You don't have to have the best advice. You just need to be present. Um, the next one are navigators. And this very often are near peers in stage of life, not necessarily age. And I actually think navigators will be way more important moving forward because life is changing so quickly. You want somebody who's only half a step or one step ahead of you because they understand what is happening right now, what the context looks like right now, what the campus feels like right now. You know, if I was giving somebody college advice, my God, that would be dated. But so would somebody giving college advice who graduated last year and never experienced pandemic college. Right. And so you see the importance of having somebody who, because of the dynamicism, who really is just has a, a little bit more insight, a little bit more exposure. We can design for that through 
online communities, social media groups, and, you know, in-person groups and clubs. Um, all of those are really important. I have a girlfriend, Julia Freeland Fisher, who wrote a great book called Who You Know. She talks a lot about some of the digital platforms that are really good ones. I mean, there are some bad ones, but there are some really good ones that connect people with people who are similar to them. And that's important or going through similar things. Um, and then door openers can be people or programs. And this is that um, sense of researchers look at it as um, that there are social bonds, which are really those lifelines, you know, I'm bonding with you. And then social bridges, which is you, you are over here and you need to be up and over here and I'm connected there. I'm going to bring you with me. And then I'm going to open the door and say, this person is welcome here. And there's a lot of equity implications to door openers, but door openers are vital because ultimately so much of the way that the world works is based on who you know, who they know, and what people think they know about you. And so having those social sponsors, those door openers is critical. And again, it's something we can design for. Um, particularly through those extracurricular and enrichment activities. That's where they're really, really rich. Yeah, that's that's really a good point. And because there are a lot of students that, you know, I can think in my life of the, the door openers that I had, and it was largely because of the, the, the family I was born into. You know, we my dad had connections. We knew people in different, you know, different colleges, different, you know, different fields. And um, it wasn't an extensive list, but it was definitely these little kind of these nuggets, these little places where, oh, you know, I know I can put you in touch with that person. And, and I, and because of that sort of launch pad, I was able, I'm able to connect other, you know, more people to those, to that, that chain. Um, but students that are young people that don't have that how do they, you know, how, how do we help them build that? You know, how do they, how do they build that? How do they get, how do they get from the, the you know, bridging that gap? Like you said. It's so, true. I mean, I had a, I have a mentor, Greg, who um, worked on the South side of Chicago for a long time. And he helped write a book called, you can't be what you can't see, <laughs> you know, and like that exposure is vital. I, you, you read in the book, I tell a dramatic story of, Growing up, periods of being quite poor, and then I ended up on a college campus with a GED in West Palm Beach. And the because I was I was young, I didn't have a car, I didn't have a driver's license, so the only place I could walk to was Palm Beach to get to stores, to have a job, to um, you know do anything. And that's the wealthiest community in the United States. And there's a connection between cash and, and social capital so much, but it was a stratospheric. I don't even know if that's a word, but like the level of change of what I was exposed to. And even just, it wasn't even, um, social sponsorship at that point. It was just opening up the blinds and saying like, this is what the world could be. It changed everything for me. Um, you know, even beginning to just plant those seeds can be enough. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And it's just, you know, you, you kind of, I guess, in a way stumbled upon, upon that, um, which is very fortunate, but you know, a lot of kids don't, don't have that, that doesn't happen. And so we, as, as educators and parents need to try to, you know, help them understand that and help them understand how important that is. Um, I had a little personal story. It was really interesting. This week we started soccer again, like for the first time in a year, you know, <laughs> and um, I have it, my, my oldest has not, you know, been in a sport or anything. And it was really eye opening. And I was thinking about your book too, because it was really eye opening. His whole attitude has shifted. And I'm, I probably shouldn't say this out loud because I'm going to mess it up, <laughs> but you know, he just, he had a hard time with this, this isolation and, just, I mean, I asked him how for his first practice went, how he felt about it. And his only response was, 
amazing. And that's not something he normally said. <laughs> that's high praise. Um, but it was just him, like, kind of, you could see this weight, like, just having those people around him, just being able to interact and having those connections is just such a, such a, a lifeline for him. It's really, it's, this whole week has been a dream <laughs> for, for his, his relationship and with me. It's amazing. I was just going to say really quickly, I mean, we know as moms, like it probably won't stay that way, but I do think it's worth noting for anybody who's working or raising tweens and teens who's listening that, um, and I talk about this in the be the beginning of the book, actually, that uh, tweens and teens are designed to be hyper connected because it's the way that their brain works. And so they actually need that. Your son needs that in order for him to have all of the lights on in his brain for learning and development. And so for any any kid who's in that tweeny, teeny phase, um, the lights have been dimmed for the last year and we just need to name it and know that that's a thing. And yeah, that, that he literally like his brain and his body needed that experience on the soccer field. Yeah. It's, it's, it was amazing. Like I was so excited that coach said, Oh, we're going to have three practices this week. And I'm like, bring it on. Let's just go <laughs> every, every night. Let's just do it. But yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it's, it really is apparent. Like they just needed that connection. I know at one point he was on, I've, I've got a little bit looser with some of the social media because of the isolation with him and I monitor it, but you know, I'm like letting him have things I wasn't going to let him use until middle school or later. And um, one day early in the pandemic, there's all this noise and I'm like, what is going on? He's, he's like, well, I'm talking to, I'm talking to on Snapchat. I'm like, what, who are you talking to? He's like the fifth grade. I'm like, what? The whole, the whole fifth grade is on. <laughs> and it was just, it was kind of a funny juxtaposition because at the time we were still dealing with the school couldn't get the technology to work and everything was clunky, but somehow the entire fifth grade was able to connect easily, seamlessly with <laughs> it. was kind of funny. Right. Um, it's, but they need, they really do need that. Um, so you also talk about, you talk about this idea of, of cash. And I love that you mentioned financial literacy and how that looks a lot different from traditionally what we, the, the little bit, if we give them, give them financial literacy at all in schools, it's just, um, something that, that Entre Ed, my organization, we are, it's kind of one of our, one of our big flags that we fly because we, we just, we know that financial literacy is not happening. And if it is, it's not generally happening in a way that is meaningful anymore. Um, and you talk about how this idea of, you know, as you mentioned that, that traditional model of, you know, you, you save, you know, you, you get a job and you start to save money and you try to save more than you spend and you keep saving a little bit more year after year. And then again, you come out the other end and you get to retire and have this little nest egg and you try to be better. You try to be better off than your parents were. And you try to make your children set your children up to be better off than you are. And that doesn't really work anymore. So I would love for you to talk about, about that and what we can do to support students to understand what the financial landscape is like. Cause I know my situation is not that way. <laughs> totally. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. So I feel like there are these um, issues in my life that I could go on like a complete tear on. And you probably can like hear the frustration as I'm writing this section. You know, I feel similarly about honestly, like gun violence in schools. There are a couple of things that for me just feel so wrong and off and fixable. And, um, and, and preparing our kids for the realities of life knowing as adults how much cash matters and not doing sometimes anything often enough to prepare them for that it is such a moral conflict for me because my god cash matters like we know it we feel it we anyone who's ever ever struggled because we don't have enough of it we know it but but as adults, we know how expensive life is. And um, you're absolutely right. So 
So when I was running a school, the state of Missouri at the time, I don't know if this has changed. I haven't looked at it. But at the time, the financial literacy requirement was a multiple choice, one credit deal. And high schoolers just had to pass the multiple choice test in order to get their financial literacy credit. And I was running this school for 17 to 21 year olds, many of whom were parents themselves or helping to provide financially for their household. And the, the difference between their lived experience and then what education said was sufficient or accurate or reflective was so extreme. And it felt offensive to even tackle investment strategy um, without also giving a grounding on not only saving, but spending, not only investment, but debt. And, and so, you know, hear me super clearly. I believe every kid should be equipped to know how to invest and accrue interest and money and be all of those pieces, but it can't be in the absence of a really accurate grounding on what is the financial life cycle going to look like for you. And what we know is, and what many of us have experienced this past year ourselves, is that we have to prepare for times of being poor or cash scarcity, that at every single income level, there's a level of financial volatility. So there are the issues of poverty, which are different and separate, and they connect um, in really important ways in terms of how learning happens. And then there are the issues of scarcity or like financial crisis. And that can happen at any income bracket. That can happen to any family. And it reminds me in some ways of during the pandemic, I was listening, I love Brene Brown, and she did this uh, podcast early on where she said, your brain doesn't know that other people have it worse off than you. Your brain only knows that it's tough for you right now. And I would say the same is true with financial health. Your brain doesn't care. A kid's brain doesn't care that Stephanie is way poorer than, than you are. The brain only knows that your family is experiencing some kind of cash scarcity now and that it's going to impact how you treat each other, what the feeling is in the household, the level of stress, what it means for changes in your own life. And so we just need to be like super compassionate and understanding. We can be deeply, deeply committed to supporting kids who are living in poverty and understanding and knowing what that means. And we should, every educator should, while still being super compassionate and supportive of a kid who may be from a middle-class home, whose parent just lost a job and it's completely turned over their lives because they didn't have savings. Um, and everything is about to change in that kid's life. As educators, we have to hold both. So what the book does, which is probably a little risky, but my commitment was like, let's be honest that life is hard, is it actually looks at what happens to the brain during times of scarcity and how do you keep kids learning? when they are going through those periods, because they will. At some level, at some time, they will. And then how do you support kids in getting ahead? And then how do you support them in learning this financial model, which these incredible, incredible researchers, um, Rachel Schneider and uh, Murdoch, Jonathan Murdoch, who wrote the financial diaries, talk about as smoothing out that kids actually need to learn financial health is not climbing the ladder or riding the upward escalator, but it's more of a roller coaster. And then like, how do you stay balanced or smooth out? I love that idea. I was actually going to, I actually was going to ask you about the smoothing out of the smoothing out idea, because that's, it's, it's so important. And, um, I know in, you know, that we talked about that a little bit last time about, you know, Maslow over blooms and how you figure out, you know, how do you make learning important when a kid doesn't know where their next meal is coming from or, 
or just when a kid's going through some, some period of crisis, you know, I know that my family has, you know, we had a medical thing happen years ago and it took us down. And so one of the lessons learned from that was that's not happening again. So I, you know, we put, you know, measures in place that, and, and which thank goodness, because this pandemic would have done the same if, if we hadn't, um, but it was, you know, I mean, and we're middle class, you know, family. And, and it was that roller coaster, like of, oh my gosh, we just, we thought we were ready, but when I couldn't work and, you know, and my husband's going, maybe going to the hospital every day to, you know, and he can't do overtime and things. There was just this huge, um, huge issue on top of the already difficult issue. So, um, and that's, you know, and that's hard. And our family had to, my kids were little, little, little kids, um, you know, and had to deal with that and had to deal with, um, you know, this, this issue of suddenly this issue of, of scarcity. Um, so that's, that's really, um, that's really a good point of how do we, how do we support a kid that is only thinking about this one thing? That's right. And, and I think, you know, your experience is so hard and is so common medical debt housing debt mortgage rent foreclosure rising cost in some communities there's a term i introduce in the book precarity and it sort of lives next to scarcity but it's it's what you just said it's the suddenly and then suddenly we were in crisis you know and it's because there's not a, a big nest egg for most american families yeah, and I think we're seeing that a lot too with the with the pandemic. I mean, people that never that never thought that they would experience this, you know. And I think everyone's ha has this level of this is in some way this has impacted you, you know, financially and 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 otherwise. And you're whether you're dealing with the financial scarcity or you're dealing with any kind of scarcity, like, like toilet paper scarcity, you know, but it's that it's, it, that's really interesting when you suddenly feel like, oh my gosh, I can't get this. I don't have what I used to have. I can't get it. And there's nothing I can do about it. So you, you, that it, you obsess about that, you know, you obsess about that idea of what's going to happen next. And you can't really think or process much else. Yeah, that's right. It's the preoccupation. There's a term for it, tunneling. We get tunnel vision and it's biology. It's not that you're not strong enough, right? It's that like biologically we hone in on that thing that we know that we need that we don't have. Um, and the good news is there are strategies that scarcity is so profound and so common that actually what we need is better infrastructure and support, better services for kids, um, plus really good strategies for how to keep them moving forward, even when times are hard. Yeah, that's so true. And I know our educators do, you know, they work so hard trying it, especially now it's, it was really eye opening. And I think, I think everybody had a collective um, eye opener <laughs> experience with, with educators and what they have had to do to try to get to kids during this time and to try to, I mean, I have a friend who is literally was spending every single day driving around, put, he was like, I'm putting 400 miles on my car in a week and in, in, in a, you know, a 20 mile radius because he's just trying to find kids to figure out what they need, bring them food or to just, just talk to them, just put, you know, put eyes on them to know that they're okay. And, um, and it's just really, it just, it's put a big spotlight on what, how, how much support teachers give to students and how valuable what they do is. Um, and, and they're, they're freaking heroes, right? Like, and so many of them are parents themselves. So not only are they doing that, but they're attempting to do all of the same things that for those of us no longer in the classroom or not in the classroom um, that that we're juggling to do. I just, yeah, my my heart goes out to them and and such just heroes, absolute heroes. It's it's so true. I got a little bit of a taste of it last week. I was able to go into a classroom of a friend of mine 
Um, and just for one class, like for an hour and a half, right? And half of her students are virtual. And I mean, I just, I so enjoyed spending time with the kid. It just, I, it was, it was surreal. It was like, <laughs> got to talk to these kids and just listen to their high school kids, listen to their personalities and, and just the, the things that they've experienced. And I'm not sure how much learning happened. Um, but the teacher was letting me do it. So it was fine. <laughs> but it was just so nice to be able to interact with them. We did like some entrepreneurship things and um, had a lot of fun. But the kids that were online, it was so challenging because I didn't know. I, I, you just don't get the feedback. Even if you, even if they turn their camera on, you just don't get that, that level of feedback and you don't know if you're reaching them. You don't know if you're engaging with them. And I talked to the teacher afterwards. She said, yeah, this whole time it's, it's felt almost like I'm talking to an empty room because I don't really know if I'm supporting them the way that they need to be supported. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's been a, you know, it's been tough for them. And I know that they are, they're freaking heroes. And I, you know, I, I want to kick myself every time I got a little bit testy, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> over, over the course of this year with school, because I'm dealing with my own frustrations at home. And I'm like, why, why can't we go back to school? Why, you know, but it's, but it's, it was really a, a shift and I hope it shifts back soon, but <laughs> it won't shift uh -huh. back. It won't sh shift back completely the way that it was, um, which it will have, will be good and bad at the same time, I think. But wonderful. Well, um, as I would like to um, ask you this, we we generally ask um, our guests at the towards the end of the podcast. You know, is there what advice? What piece of advice could you give an educator or someone that's supporting young people um, in the context of of your book and the topics that you cover? You know, what what would be a piece of advice that you would give a teacher, say, that wants to support these students and prepare them for this this next chapter of their lives um, that they might not have heard so far? Oh, let's see here. So I think I want to go back to you mentioned the sort of Maslow before blooms and, and say that we're in a time right now where we need to attend to kids surviving and thriving at once, that it can't be one or the other, that focusing on achievement and success and flourishing in the absence of naming and understanding the stress and trauma and realities that were happening this year at varying depths and levels for each kid, just as with every listener on this podcast. Um, and that that is a journey we need to go on together. Making it was about how to prepare kids for a world that is still unjust and unfair and hard. Like life can be hard and that they deserve, and we do too, a really accurate roadmap of what it's gonna take, even as we're trying to create a better world and make sure, you know, as a mom, I don't want my kids to just make it. I want them to thrive. I want them to have an amazing life. And I know that when things are hard, I have to also focus on health and healing. And so as we move forward, I would love to see educators across the country shift from college and career readiness and completion as proxies that really the focus should be on long and livable lives and well being. And are the kids okay? Right. And, and so if we can, and are we okay? <laughs> what do we all have to do? And so every time that you're thinking about completion and getting through and pushing through and did we finish or college and career readiness, if you can swap that out for, are the kids okay? Do they have what they need? Is this going to sort of contribute to their well-being and their well-becoming what what is happening now and what will happen right like that is what i want to see 
That is what I hope for. Um, and, and for any educator who's listening in, you know, we're, we're recording this, um, at the end of April and like summer's coming, my friend. <laughs> and I just hope that you get, you get a good sweet break because wow, what, what a time this has been. What a year and a half this has been. It sure has. I was going to close with that well-being and well-becoming because that's <laughs> that was end of your you stole my thunder. <laughs> <That's so funny. laughs> I stole your thunder and you stole it back. But it was but that that was such a, such a kind of a it's the end of the book and it's just such a, a one of those aha kind of moments where like oh yeah because it's that well the well-being and well-becoming and the idea of being able to you know be ready for the world in so many different ways, not just as, okay, I've checked this box and now I have this credential or this, you know, completed this diploma or done, but it's being ready for what's coming at you and being able to, to be okay, to, you know, to be okay in, in the world. Um, and another thing that you say in your book too, is that, that readiness for tomorrow is a right, should be a right for That's our right. young people. Mm-hmm. I think that's so important. And then the readiness, just, it's not just the college and career checkbox ready. It's readiness for the emotional things and the social things and all of those things that are coming at these kids that, that a lot of us didn't have to deal with or didn't have to deal with in such a dramatic way. I mean, the world is like, like <laughs> famous line from a song 30 years ago, world's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's right, just, yeah, that's so, right. many, so many things that these kids have to think about now that weren't ever present, I guess, when, when I was growing up. So that's such a important, important thing to consider, but, oh gosh, well, I, I'm so excited to have been blessed to have spoken with you, Stephanie and um, I know this is going to be an amazing, an amazing podcast. I know our listeners are going to enjoy it. Um, and I, I just, <laughs> I was <laughs> looking at your book. I'm like, wow, she has like 20 more books in after this. Cause there's so many, each one of these areas could be unpacked in just so many different ways. It's, it's really a good place for an educator or anyone, a mom, anybody to just get a good, a good picture of how to support your children, or like you said, whoever your children might be, they, you know, the, the kids in your classroom, kids in your youth group, whatever it is, your own children. Um, it's just a really good, honest look of, of, on good, honest look at the, the landscape and how to support young people. So I appreciate you. I appreciate you for writing it. And I hope that we get to continue conversations in the future. This was lovely. And I, yeah. so, Absolutely. It's funny. Um, before we were recording, Stephanie and I were, we kind of have a lot in common. We have kids the same age. We have, we also swim <laughs> or we're trying to swim again, which is very frustrating. <laughs> um, but it's just, it's been lovely meeting you and getting to know a little bit more about you. So I appreciate it. Thanks, Toy. Yeah, it's been great. And I would say for anybody who's listening, who picks up a copy of Making It, What Today's Kids Need for Tomorrow's World, if you reach out to me on Twitter, or if you find my email on my website, www.stephaniemaliakraus.com, and um, share that you bought this book because you listened to Toy and the EntreEd podcast, I'd love to send you a signed book plate. Um, and just really look forward to partnering toy with you and swapping, swimming, parenting, working (laughs) all the stories for years to come. (laughs) I appreciate that. And yeah, we will put all that information too in the, in the show notes so that you can go there and just click on it. So it'll be really easy to do, but definitely check out this book. It is beautiful book and I'm just so grateful. So thank you so much, Stephanie. And I look forward to our next conversation. Thanks, Toy.